For Colonel Templeton Hargis, it was just too much. Hell was bubbling below his feet, and the man who had made it was frying in his own mad doctor stew. He looked around at the horrified faces of his men, staring at the manhole where Dr. Trimble had just disappeared. He saw reflected in those men's faces his own confusion, his own feelings of helplessness. The Soviet Union was half a world away now, a very distant threat to the national security. But the hell spawn created by Dr. Trimble in his satellite laboratory was right beneath their butts, and the trouble was, it seemed, not to have the faintest inkling that it should be patriotic and loyal to its creators. The motherfucker would eat anything. Hargis ripped off his helmet and threw it to the ground. He grabbed an M-16 from one of his men. Let's scrag that thing, he said. He stuck his rifle barrel down the manhole and let her rip. Other soldiers stepped up along with him, aimed down the hole, and began firing, making a furious din. The kick of the gun was gratifying in his hands, but as soon as his initial wave of anger passed, Hargis realized that if that blob thing was as big as what people who'd escaped the movie theater said it was, it was going to take more than a hail of bullets to snuff the bastard. He knew just the thing, though. Give me a satchel charge, he called as the rifles finished emptying their ammo into the hole. Short fuse. He had good men. Within seconds, one of them was hauling a package the size of a phone book up to the hole. Let him have it, ordered Colonel Hargis. Connected to the satchel charge was a ripcord. The soldier pulled this and efficiently dropped the charge down the hole. It took no orders to make the other men step away from the opening. Kerblam! The explosion trembled below the feet of Colonel Hargis like the devil's own flatulence. A gout of flame ripped up from the hole, rising twenty feet in the air. Chew on that, slime ball, said Colonel Hargis. That ought to do it. The rumble from the explosion died, but then another tremble started up from below his feet. First a simple movement, but then suddenly a violent shaking. What's happening? said Hargis, struggling to stay on his feet. I think, said Brian Flagg, turning and starting to run. I think you pissed it off. Hey, kid, where are you? But Hargis never finished his sentence. He was cut off by the explosion of gunk shooting up from the manhole like God squeezing a pimple. The creature, it was coming up. Streamers of the thing whipped around as it rose, grabbing Hargis by his shoulders and hauling him up with it. Hargis found himself abruptly stuck to a rising geyser of burning, churning fluid, rising up toward the night sky. Hargis knew that this was it, but he was too hard a man, had seen too much action to go out without a fight. His M-16 blazing in one hand, bullets splattering into the column of pustulence, he reached with the other hand to the series of hand grenades strapped across his chest. He pulled the pins. Eat these too, slime ball, he thought, even as the creature swallowed him, acids violently eating away at his plastic skin, flesh, blood, and bones. Meg Penny watched as the column blasted up, snaring the soldier and carrying them up, stuck in slime. Get out of here, said Brian Flagg, catching her by the arm and pulling her down the street along with him. Up and up went the creature behind them, emerging from the sewers. Finally, it reached the peak of its ascent far above Morgan City, and it began to fall back down, angling out over the street. It slapped down onto the pavement, roiling and congealing into one large ball of coagulated muck. Meg and Brian had reached higher ground before the thing fell. The noxious slime missed them. But as they turned, they saw it snaring others, townspeople slower than they. What soldiers remained were firing into the mass. The creature rolled over them like a wave of used Vaseline, strangling their cries instantly. It's a mountain, said Meg. Get back, cried Brian, tugging her along with the escaping crowd of people. Deputy Briggs was among them and shouted orders. Back, everybody back. Chaos surged. Everything was in total pandemonium, and among it all the blob struck. Hungry. It was still hungry. Colonel Hargis's grenades went off inside it, lighting a chiriosco of green and red within its form, but explosives couldn't stop the oozing thing from cruising on in search of more food. Reverend Meeker had never been such of an eschatologic, but he knew something of what the Bible had predicted about the end times, and this looked like something biblical, all right. The judgment of God come to Morgan City. My God, he said, watching the creature roll along. The day is come. Deputy Briggs grabbed him. Come on, Reverend. Gotta get out of here. You don't understand, said Reverend Meager, gazing up at the monstrosity, acceptance and resignation on his face. This is all prophesied in Revelations. Deputy Briggs tugged him along anyway. 
Meanwhile, a pair of soldiers nearby were working with a flamethrower. One held the weapon while the other lit it. There was a muffled thump as the flames poured out. You're hot, said the lightning soldier. Soldier holding the flamethrower turned. The creature was heading straight toward him, a tidal wave of horror. The soldier aimed and hit the trigger. The flames roared out, wrapping the monster in smoke and fire. We got it, cried the soldier. We got the thing. It's burning up. But then a pseudopod shot from the blob, as though from a cannon, heading straight at the nozzle of the flamethrower. It struck with such force that the tanks on the soldier's back exploded, engulfing him in a fireball. Flaming fluid splattered over the street. A splash of it fell on the Reverend Meeker, setting him all alight. The Reverend screamed and fell, writhing on the street. Reverend, cried Meg, seeing the man go down, his arms and back on fire. That fire extinguisher, said Deputy Briggs, pointing over to a fire truck parked nearby. Meg dashed over to it along with the wounded deputy, and together they hauled the heavy, shiny cylinder off its mooring and over to where the Reverend lay burning and screaming. The blob rolled forward just thirty yards away. Meg blasted Reverend Meeker in a cloud of CO2. The flames were snuffed out. Come on, get out of that thing's way, ordered Briggs pulling the half-conscious, groaning reverend along with him. Meg turned. There it was, rising up above her, the creature wriggling and quivering with rapacious evil and hunger. Even as she looked, a pseudopod detached from the mass and shot forward towards her. Not thinking, just reacting, she turned the fire extinguisher on it. The CO2 hissed out, slapping against the pseudopod like the hand of a ghost. The pseudopod stopped, recoiled like a snake, writhing in pain. Meg backed away, having bought herself some time. Thinking, the CO2, it stopped it for a moment. She sprayed some of the stuff onto her hand. The cloud wrapped her hand in an arctic chill. Cold, she said. It can't stand the cold. She had to tell Brian. She whirled around to find him. Brian, she cried. It's just like in the freezer. But Brian was nowhere in sight. Only the frightened, smudged face of Deputy Briggs was there. He ran for it, Meg, said Briggs. He's gone. Now let's get ourselves going. Town Hall. It's got the strongest walls in the city. They retreated. The creature, like a wobbling slow-motion avalanche of dung, followed squeezing easily through the stores and office buildings of either side of the street. As Deputy Briggs carried the moaning reverend, Meg lugged the CO2 canister along behind, pausing every ten seconds or so to blast errant streams of goo. Invariably, the pseudopods would wriggle back into their parent in spasms of cold. Once when she accidentally released a particularly large cloud of gas, the stuff sprayed over the nearest part of the crawling blob. The thing cringed back, and they were able to gain some yards. Good girl, said Briggs. Keep it going. Town Hall's just ahead. The whole street seemed to bow under the blob's weight, cracking as it streamed along. Meg let it have another, longer blast, and then dodged back. Pseudopods waggled wildly behind her. The blob shuddered, then flowed on in inexorably. Even as they mounted the steps of the town hall, the thing flowed its hellish protoplasm up after them, a deadly tide lapping up toward their feet. The CO2 canister banged up the stairs, heavy and awkward to drag, but Meg couldn't drop it. It was their only hope. She sprayed. The blob quivered and drew back. The hard stench, acid and blood, acid and death, was everywhere now, mixed with the smell of burning, but all that Meg could smell was the CO2. Her hands were numb with cold. Hurry, cried a voice from the top of the stairs. Get in. Someone was holding the door open for them. Thanks, said Briggs, as a man scurried out and helped drag Reverend Meeker inside. Come on, Meg, get in. Meg Penny let loose a long blast. The blob pulled back, rearing like a fat giant cobra, and hurled itself, coming down at her like a blanket, cutting off the light from burning fires and the remaining street lamps. The arm reached out and pulled Meg through the door. The town hall door slammed shut, locked, and latched. What a mighty thunk. The door was hit from the other side. It bowed in from the tremendous pressure. But it held. Tendrils of blob issued through cracks. But Meg Penny knew what to do now. She aimed the nozzle and let blast. She described a circle around the door, covering all the cracks quickly. The wriggling streamers shivered and shot back as though shocked by electrodes. Doesn't like that, said Meg. She turned and saw to her relief that all her family, Kevin included, were among the huddled masses in the town hall. She saw Moss the mechanic, Jim Adams the banker. So many people were still alive. She thought so many would be dead. Pull all that CO2 you can find, cried Deputy Briggs. We can hold it off. You hold it off, cried Arnold Thatcher, the baker from the back of the hall. We're getting out. He dived toward a back window, pulled on the latch as the crowd rippled with agreement. No, wait, cried Meg desperately. It's all... 
but even if she tried to finish, tried to haul her fire extinguisher towards Thatcher at the window, the man got the latch loose. The window angled open on its hinges. A jet of blob streamed through right on top of the man, engulfing him. Meg aimed the nozzle and fired off a blast of CO2 gas, but with a choked gurgle, the issuing stream stopped. The canister was empty. People started screaming. Lost the mechanic, though, had already stepped up to the nearest fire extinguisher placement. He pulled open the door, ripped out the canister, and started spraying the arm of gunk. The effect was immediate. The blob retreated back out the window, but it carried its prize with it. Meg had one last impression of Arnold Thatcher the baker being dragged out of the window, already dissolved in his portable living acid bath. Moss kept the blast going long enough for others to close the window and latch it. That's not enough, hollered Briggs. We're going to have to barricade every window, every door here. And let's get those fire extinguishers. There should be some in the hall, lots in the basement. The people set to work, doing their best to barricade themselves from harm. Streamers of blob snaked through the front door, and Meg Penny yelled for help. Within moments, Moss was there, spraying, and the streamers retreated. The two men ran up behind Briggs, holding a fire extinguisher. Small fire extinguishers. Is that it, said Briggs? There's got to be more. You just didn't look in the right places. He was interrupted by a loud scream from a woman who was scrambling away from an air vent. The blob was squeezing through. Shit, said one of the men with an extinguisher. He hurried over to the vent and blasted the monster pseudopod with a plume of gas. The streamer of blob wriggled back. The man was just helping the lady to her feet when another large spout of slime suddenly spurted from a nearby chimney. It wrapped around the man, knocking the fire extinguisher from his grasp. Help, he cried. He was able to say only the one word before the pseudopod pulled him up into the chimney and into the darkness. Oh my God, cried someone. Look, the front door. Meg Penny looked. Briggs looked. Everyone looked. But there was nothing that could be done. The door latch, bending with the renewed bowing of the doors, snapped even as they looked. Crack! And the door started to buckle. No, a man cried as one, ten people, including Briggs and Mr. Penny, ran to the front door, pushing against the barricade of desks and cabinets to keep the doors in place. But the fissures in the wood continued, and wherever there was the smallest of cracks, the blob would squiggle through. Moss climbed up on the barricade. He aimed the nozzle of his canister and fired at the streaming stuff coming through a particularly large crack. One good gust pushed it back for a moment, but then, with a strangled coughing sound, the canister went dry. Deputy Bill Briggs, straining against a bookshelf, used to block the door, cried, We need more CO2 up here! He was pushing for all he was worth. If they could just get some more fire extinguishers, they had to be here if these nitwits could just find them, and Briggs heard a crack. The next thing he knew, books were scattered everywhere onto the floor by his feet. The creature had pushed through the... like a pincer, two segments of the blob, blasted out, flowed around Deputy Briggs' waist, and closed in on him. They burned. Oh, God, they burned. They sank through cloth and flesh. Meg Penny watched helplessly, holding on to her mother and her baby sister, Christine, as the blob wrapped around Deputy Bill Briggs and pulled him through the bookcase. Screams, crack of wood, snap of bone and splatter of blood, and then the lawman was gone. The sight of the deputy being dragged, clutching a bookshelf, as though we would check the terrible force behind him, eyes rolling in horror and pain, was the final blast on the survivor's nerves. Those nerves snapped. Pandemonium struck. People screamed and panicked. They ran toward the basement and other rooms, leaving their posts by the barricades. And with an extra surge of power, the blob began breaking in. Windows smashed. Doors buckled and shattered. Whole sections of wall and roof were cracking and bulging. Plaster rained down on Meg Penny and her family as they stood rooted in place with terror, watching the blob wiggle through the new cracks. On the floor in the middle of the chaos, the Reverend Meeker had recovered. Seeing the hell squeezing in on him, he began moaning and speaking deliriously. And the great voice said to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour the vows of wrath of God upon the earth. And lo, there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon men which had the mark of the beast. Meg Penny heard this scripture, and she was too terrified even to comprehend what the reverend was saying. She just clung to her family as the blob put more and more pressure on the once sturdy town hall until the rafters and the solid brick of the walls began to squeal and tremble as though in terrible agony. Mommy, cried Kevin, don't let it get us. But Meg Penny knew the truth. It was going to get them. The monster was going to get them just as it had gotten the others. She was too frightened and horrified to even wonder what had happened to Brian Flagg. It can't stand the cold, 
Meg's words echoed in Brian Flagg's mind, but he'd already figured it out. He knew it as soon as he saw those pseudopods retreat under the spray of CO2 as Meg Penny extinguished the fire on Reverend Meeker. Cold, of course. He'd been so stupid. Why they'd been in the freezer and the tentacles of the monster had stopped short, withdrawing back through the door cracks, that had been what had stopped the creature, sub-zero temperature. Now, the thing on the surface rolling around like an unanchored mountain, there was only one way to stop it, and that was with cold. There was a big ice house here in Morgan City, but no way could he convince that monster to come along and get inside it. Now, the cold was going to have to be brought to the creature, and Brian Flagg was going to be the guy to do it. He ran through the night with surprising speed and energy, considering how much he'd already gone through that evening. He ran down the street to Moss's repair shop, praying that the door wasn't locked. The door was locked. Shit! Behind him he heard the gunfire and the screams and the roar of people running from the advancing monster. Shit! he cried. The side door of the shop had a second, sanctioned frame window. Brian Flagg smashed his fist through the glass nearest the door. Shattered glass tinkled into the darkness. Brian reached in, felt for the knob, unlocked the door, and burst through. His hand was bleeding, but he didn't notice. Cold, cold, cold. The word throbbed through his head as he ran into the shop where the hulking shadows of a machine lurked. He hoped that Moss had gotten around to fixing the thing. Brian fumbled for the light switch. No light. Electricity was gone. But enough light was coming through the garage door windows to make out where the cabs were. Brian ran to the machine and clambered into the cab. He felt around in the darkness, praying that, yes, his fingers touched the key. Almost slotted into the ignition. Okay, buddy, he got it work. He turned the key, the engine whined, and died. Shit. No, this was unacceptable. He tried again. The engine growled like a leashed mountain lion. Growled and growled, turning over, but only on the power of the battery, and... Brian stepped on the accelerator. The engine roared into life. He buckled the safety harness into place, turned the cab lights and headlights on, and then fumbled with the emergency brake. Brake off, he downshifted the gear, brought up by the clutch, the mighty machine lurched forward. There was no time to figure out how to unlock the front garage doors, so Brian Flagg slammed the Indian Summit snowmaker right through them. Glass broke and wood shattered as the door exploded outward. Stepping up the speed, Brian Flagg hurled the machine into the night. There were parked cars in front of him, but he paid them no mind. The snowmaker blasted through them, sending the careening away like ten pins struck with a bowling ball. The big-wheeled machine roared onward, its enormous tractor tires bouncing across the bumpy pavement. The headlights picked up the ghastly carnage wreaked by the thing, twisted autos, pieces of bodies, slime. Uh, Brian tried to ignore it as he directed the snowmaker up the street. Town Hall, he thought. They must have run for cover to Town Hall. He headed in that direction. He could see it from two blocks away, and it was grotesque. The blob was attached to the town hall like a throbbing parasite, roiling and shaking as it tried to crush the building. Meg was in that building, Meg and the others. As he headed toward the creature, Brian looked down to the controls of the snowmaker. He'd worked on one of these things before with Moss, and the dude had showed him what lever did what, but he never really actually used the machine before. But he knew how it worked. On top of the cab was a big funnel-like chute that dispensed the snow, while the snowmaking apparatus was housed on the flatbed back of the truck. This included big metal water tanks and a grouping of tanks of liquid nitrogen that looked like airplane bombs. The central machine siphoned measured quantities of both through its pipes and then blew out the resulting mixture, man-made snow, from the large blower hooked onto the front. Brian brought the machine right up to the blob and stopped it, its air brakes hissing. The headlights shone through the red porridge and saliva body of the monstrosity. Brian could smell it, and he had to control his revulsion. He turned on the snowmaker. With a great gurgling and churning around the machine, set to work immediately. After a growl and a lurch, the chute above the cab began to spit out a lovely high arc of snow that burst up through the night and landed squarely on the monster. Behind Brian, mist from the machine rose up into the night air. He turned the controls up to full, and a heftier dollop of new snow burst up, spattering onto the blob. The creature trembled. The creature shook. Its hold on the town hall had seemed unbreakable, but now the blob streamed back away, as though in terrible pain, turning to confront this new and hurtful enemy. Brian could see the waves of steam rose up from the blob wherever snow touched it. Some kind of chemical reaction was going on. It was working. He kept the snow blowing. It was going to bury this thing in snow, bury it until it was covered with this beautiful white stuff, and then he, Brian Flagg, was going to strap on skis and slalom the bastard. 
But then the blob, with a speed that bellied its heft, rippled away from the torrent of snow. It moved towards its attacker, rolling faster and faster. Shit, said Brian. Okay, you want to eat me? Eat me! But you're going to have to eat five tons of snow first. Snow still pouting. He shifted his engine into gear and popped the clutch. He turned the wheel so that the vehicle was heading straight for the cannonballing monster. His repositioning put the snow dead center back onto the blob, and the creature didn't like it, not at all. With soundless, quivering fury, it struck forward at the machine, lifting it up and hurling the truck and cab and Brian into the air, turning them over like a child's toy. Brian could feel the cab disengaging from the rest of the snowmaker, ripped away from the snow chute and the tanks of water and liquid nitrogen, and skidding off onto the pavement. The cab spun over, and the snow stopped. Brian Flagg found himself upside down, Desperately, he tried to unbuckle the belt. He could see the stuff of the monster rolling around him like steaming half-solid sewage. He heard the mental groan as the monster squeezed. As the stuff of the creature rolled past the window, Brian could also hear it slipping over above him. As he hung there, desperately working at the latch to the seat belt, he saw half-digested bodies float by. Oh, geez, there was Deputy Briggs and one of the soldiers in one of the plastic suits. Skeleton fingers clacked onto the glass as spider webs of cracks appeared, death knock knock knocking to get in. The belt unlatched. He dropped down to the ceiling of the cab, struggling to get up and onto his feet. The cab squealed as though caught in a crusher, but then just as he himself got upright, a length of bare metal crunched in, cracking him across the forehead. Brian Flagg fell unconscious as the blob squeezed on the cab of the snowmaker, pushing to get at this new bit of food. It was so hungry, so hungry, but now it knew other sensations, much less pleasurable sensations. The blob hurt. These bits of food, somehow they had hurt it with the terrible waves of cold they sprayed at it. Primordial fury swept through primitive synapses and in turn its enemies and stopped it. The hurt stopped too, and the other sensations swept in. It was hungry again. Hungry. First, Meg Penny heard the engine motors outside, and then the squeal of air brakes. Then the roof of the town hall shook even harder, as though the monster had suffered some kind of paroxysm. Then the shaking stopped. The streamers of the blob withdrew. Meg could hear the creature slithering away. It left a gaping hole in the front door. Detaching herself from her family, Meg ran out through the hole and onto the steps, still slimy and gooey. She could see the snowmaker clearly now, spouting out its load onto the cringing blob and she could see who was in the cab. Brian Flagg. Brian, she cried, and she ran to help him. Meg, called her mother behind her. No! But the call did no good. She had to go and help Brian. That thing had to be stopped. Determination and pure anger swelled up in Meg Penny. Yes, that monster had to be stopped. But even as she ran toward the snowmaker, she watched helplessly as the blob hurled itself at it. She watched as the vehicle was lifted up like a bobbing boat and torn asunder. She watched as the blob poured over the cab, trying to get at Brian. No, she cried. No! Desperately, she looked around the ground by her feet. Wreckage everywhere. But just a few yards away, the half-dissolved body of a soldier attracted her attention. The soldier still held his M16 rifle in his death grip. Attached to his back was a belt which held a package, just like the one the colonel had ordered to be lobbed down into the manhole. Was What was it he called it? Uh, uh, oh yes, a satchel charge. First, Meg Penny peeled back the fingers of the dead man and pulled the rifle away. Then she detached the belt with the satchel charge and swung it over her shoulder. It had already been just her tiny bit of flesh and willpower against that terrible mass of rolling putrefaction. And now she had something to fight it with. She ran around to where the creature was pouring over the cab. Nearby, the detached tanks of water and liquid nitrogen lay. The blob had not poured over these. They were no longer spraying snow at it. Brian was in that cab. She had to distract the thing right away. She had watched the soldiers work their guns, and this one was already cocked. She held it up and fired at the monster. A volley of bullets tore into the thing, ripping out divots of protoplasm. The weapon's recoil pushed her back, but she recovered and gave the thing another round. Then she moved over behind the tanks. She had an idea. Come on, you pile of shit, she screamed at the top of her lungs. Come on and try to get me. She pressed the trigger, and more bullets sprayed into the blob. The thing shifted its bulk. A part of it collected onto something that could almost be a head. The head peered down through sightless eyes. She let another burst rip through the roiling protoplasm, and then she scrambled up to the tanks lying on the ground by the cab. 
It was working. The blob was releasing the snowmaker's cab. It sensed easier prey, or had it indeed been maddened by the bullets and her challenge. You can do better than that, she jeered. Come on! She emptied the chambers of the M16 and then threw the rifle itself at the advancing blob. Then she pulled the satchel charge up by its belt and looked around. Right there, between those two massive tanks of liquid nitrogen, Meg Penny was a skier. She knew exactly what these things would do. What incredible cold was locked away in the metal under extreme pressure. She wedged the satchel charge down between the tanks. Now how had that soldier done it? She looked up, gauging how much time she had before that rippling stuff rolled over these tanks. Come to mama, fucker, she whispered. She looked back down at the satchel charge and its dangling ripcord. Hopefully you had to adjust it to make it short fuse, which meant uh, this one was a long fuse. She'd have time to get away, time to get Brian out of that cab. She pulled the cord, the satchel charge started ticking. The blob crawled toward her like the upended contents of a witch's cauldron. Good enough, she thought, as she prepared to jump from the tanker to the ground. But her boot snagged on a piece of twisted metal sticking out from the tanker's hole. She could feel herself tripping, body hurling out but legs staying in place. With a breathless whoosh, she found herself swinging upside down from the tanks, dangling. As she swayed back and forth, she could see her father and Moss running towards her from the town hall. Stay back, she cried. Stay back, it's going to blow. Above her, she could hear the ticking of the satchel charge. She couldn't pull herself up. This was it. At least her death wouldn't be meaningless, she thought. If that satchel charge blew, so would the tanks, and the tanks would... But she didn't give up. She strained up, trying to yank her foot from the boot. Straining, straining. Suddenly something caught her around the shoulders. It twisted her and it pulled her straight down, sliding her bloody foot out of the boot. The blob, it had gotten her with one of its tendrils. But as she tumbled to the ground, she quickly discovered that she wasn't covered by slime. She was covered by Brian Flagg. But not for long. Come on, get up, he ordered as he got, her, got up and hoisted her to her feet. She heard the satchel charge ticking again. The next thing she knew, she was running. Running for all she was worth, back toward Daddy and Moss in the town hall, and she ventured to look back. The blob had covered the tanker fully now, and it was advancing after them, rolling over the machine. God damn it, she said. It's supposed to blow up. But nothing happened, and the monster was on the loose, coming after them. Brian Flagg woke up. The first thing he realized was that he was in a lot of pain. Not just his aching leg, which he'd hurt in his bike spill, now his head hurt real bad. He could feel the blood seeping out, dripping down his face. And then Brian remembered. He remembered where he was and what was crushing in upon him. He looked up, expecting the gunk to spill in on him at any moment, to engulf him, to fill his mouth and his nose and his ears with burning acid, to burn away his eyes. But there was nothing outside the windows, just a residue of slime. He didn't wait a moment. He propelled himself against the door, hitting the handle. The door opened, and Brian Flagg spilled out of the upside-down cab. It took a moment to collect himself, but as soon as he had, he looked around immediately saw the montaneous creature pouring across the tanker. And there, hanging from the tanker, her boot caught was Meg Penny. From the tanker, there came a loud ticking sound. Not sparing any time even to think, he ran to Meg, and he jumped up and grabbed her, pulling her down. They hit the ground, and he urged her on, and they ran, and they ran some more. And then Meg stopped, and she said something about the tanker blowing up. What's happening, she said. I don't understand it. It was ticking, the, the satchel charge. We gotta get away from that thing now. Well, I'm telling you, said Meg, it's... And just as Brian turned to check the blob's advance, the rumbling started. He wasn't sure if the spark came first or the rumble, but it didn't take long before the light that ignited the wavery form of the truck tanker turned into a bigger light, a very bright light that thrust out and up, turning into a huge explosion. The explosion geysered up, scattering bits and shreds of the blob's protoplasm. A ground... Ripping blast of frost, water, and ice waved over him and Meg, knocking them off their feet and onto the pavement. Beyond them, an icy cloud blossomed, rising into the air, and then bits and pieces rained back down, splattering onto the ground, tinkling and crackling. Pieces of the blob turned into chunks of crystalline matter. That thing had been frozen. Brian, lying dazed in a scatter of frost and icy water, was only dimly aware of this, but he did hear Meg's voice calling, Brian? Brian? Then he realized that there were people gathered all around them, helping them up. Whoa, said Brian Flagg, looking at the carnage of ice that the monster had been reduced to. What a rush. Brian! Suddenly Meg was all over him, which he didn't mind at all. 
His arms folded around her, and his lips found hers, and they had a nice long kiss. The thing was dead. They defeated it. Then Brian looked up. He felt something on his head, looked up, and saw what was coming down. Little tumbling flakes of white stuff. Hey, man, said Moss, patting him on the shoulder. I told you we'd get snow. The black man looked up and smiled. You gotta have faith. Moss wandered over to have a look at the wreckage of the snowmaker. Brian watched as the mechanic kicked the tire. wonder if I'm covered for this sort of thing, he called back. Brian grinned. I think he got plenty of witnesses. He looked around at the people coming out of the town hall, all the people who were still alive. Yes, that thing had killed some, but most were still alive and healthy. You saved us, Brian, said Meg. I had a lot of help, said Brian, but still he felt good, real good. Everyone was looking at him, patting him on the back and releasing their fears and pent-up emotions with tears and laughs. Gee, he said, I guess it's no more Mr. Bad Guy, huh? Meg Penny smiled at him. No, you've spilled your little secret, Brian Flagg. Everyone knows now, especially me. A fireman interrupted their conversation, barging through the crowd. All right, people, he said. We got four hours till the sun comes up. Let's get a bulldozer and a dump truck and get this thing over to the ice house. But Meg was pulling him away from the crowd. What do you think you're doing? he asked. You must be tired. You've done your bit, Brian. You need rest, she said. Uh huh, uh, kiddo. He pointed down at the ground at the bits of blobs scattered all over. I'm part of this town now, and I'm going to help haul this thing where it won't do any more harm. She looked at him with a funny expression. But Brian, you always were part of the town. You just didn't feel like you belonged. He mulled that over for a moment. <clears throat> well, guess I'm stuck for a little while here. Anyway, <laughs> bike's dead. She smiled. Now that would be nice. They kissed again and they turned and pitched in to help clear up the mess. Maybe Moss could use some regular part-time help. Yeah, thought Brian Flagg. Maybe he'd stick around Morgan City after all. The preacher preached. His patchwork tent was pitched at a dusty Midwestern crossroads, bordering on flat acres of waving wheat fields. Outside were parked and battered old cars and pickup trucks of the people who'd come to hear him speak of the coming end times, come to hear his straining voice warning of the approaching chaos. The preacher preached. From a makeshift pulpit atop a creaky platform, he ranted and cried out, warning these poverty-stricken people of even worse days approaching. The will of God is written in the sky in fingers of flame. Wormwood falls from heaven, consuming sinner and saint alike. The preacher preached to his audience of black people, white people, rural farming people, people who lived in the outskirts of wealthier society. They sat in their old wooden folding chairs, intently listening to the message being hurled down at them like fire from the skies. The preacher preached. And no longer were his words soft and comforting as they had been in the days of his delusion back in the old church, back in Morgan City. His name had once been Reverend Meeker, but he had changed it to something that felt more like the name God wanted him to have. Now his name was Reverend Storm. And now when he preached, his words hailed down upon the listeners, shot through the lightning and thunder. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and sea, for the final days are upon us he said, ejecting a fine spray of spittle with his words. No longer was he the cherubic little man, full of good cheer, brimming with pastorly peace. Now his eyes burned with a manic gleam. The white fringe of hair around his head had grown out scraggly and long. It bounced and waved as he jumped up and down, propelling his words out to the fascinated audience. By the Lord's word, he yelled, the earth shall be cleansed, the disease burned out, and the temples of the prophets shall fall. Hallelujahs and amens rippled through the audience as he leaned forward on the pulpit, staring out in the flock of rural folk. There's no more time for forgiven, no more time for salvation. Who among us shall be raised to rapture when the judgment trump blows? He scanned the audience, savoring the silence, a vein in his neck just below the swath of scar tissue from his burning throbbed. Only the faithful, brothers and sisters... Only the faithful. He was emptied, emptied of his message spent. He spun and walked off the platform, fatigue waving over him. He'd given his message, and now he needed to rest. Needed rest desperately. As he pulled aside the canvas flap that separated the stage from one of the two trailers that served as his traveling revival show, Sister Martha and Brother Abner were stepping into place before the old microphone. 
Soon he could hear the sounds of their singing echoing through the makeshift hall of the tent. When the day arrives, sweet Jesus, they sang. A good hymn, thought Brother Storm, heading for his room to rest. They sung that song back at the Lutheran church in Morgan City, back before God had delivered his message to the reverend, but he never realized its full import. Now he opened the door of his little study and collapsed into a cheap folding chair. He left the door open. It was hot outside, and the room had poor ventilation. Before him was a card table with some books he'd been using for study that morning. Off to one side of the room was an old surplus army coat. He closed his eyes weary, but he knew that strength would return with rest, and then he would preach another message this evening, another message to more people coming to hear the word. On the table before him was a bottle of whiskey. Before the time of reckoning had arrived at Morgan City, he'd never drunk alcohol, but God had told him that it was all right to drink from time to time to calm his nerves. He poured a few ounces into a glass, tilted the contents, and drank. Immediately, he felt better, steadied. He leaned back in his chair and closed his eyes. When, Reverend, said a voice from the outside. When? He opened his eyes and he saw an old black woman leaning in, her face a map of hard times, her eyes filled with tears. She had been moved by his message. Ma'am, he answered softly, his voice hoarse from the preaching and the whiskey. The day of reckoning, how far off? He stood and turned, looking down at something on the card table. Soon, Mrs., he said, picking up the mason jar. He looked down at the contents. He was still amazed and grateful that he had been chosen as God's own minister of judgment. In the mason jar he'd taken from the TikTok diner, the piece of the beast crawled around aimlessly, trying to get out, trying to feed. The Lord will give me a sign, said Brother Storm. A sign. The mason jar slipped from his sweaty fingers. He caught it and placed it carefully back in its box. Not now, thought the former Reverend Meeker, but soon, soon. The blob sat in its jar waiting, waiting and crawling and roiling. It was hungry, very, very hungry. <laughs>